Hey, good morning, New Day. Good morning, everybody who's in the room this morning. Hello. It's, people aren't even going to know there's people in the room. Good morning, everybody in the room. All right. Thank you. And everybody who is uh, in your own living room or maybe you're listening to this after the fact, maybe you're here live and you're participating in the, in the chat. That's awesome. We want to know that you're here. We've got a, a link to a communication card. Um, we're almost a year into our overflow campaign, which we started in order to uh, put into place a two-year plan to move our community towards more people knowing Jesus over the next 10 years than they do now. So in order to do that, we said in the next two years, so now we're almost a year into it. Are you track? I mean, no, it's early for math, I know. Uh, what we said was there are three things that we need to do. We need to emphasize prayer. So we've had people praying daily, 12 people at least for the year 2021 every day. So if you haven't been doing that, this is a reminder. It's not too late. And then we've also invited people to do an hour of prayer every other Saturday. We put together a Saturday of prayer and we're asking people to take an hour for each second Saturday. The second Saturday of this month is coming up. So we are a praying church. We need to emphasize prayer. It's God who's going to reach people, which we're going to see in the passage that we're looking at today. So the first thing we wanted to do is emphasize prayer. And we've been doing that. We want to put our stake in the ground. We want to have a place. And we are working on that. If you want to contribute to uh, helping that happen financially, you can do that in the Overflow campaign. Find out more information on our website. If you want to contribute uh, physically, you can do that. Uh, you can find that on our Facebook page, uh, how you can help out in actually working on the building. And then the last thing is pouring out blessings. And I was so excited to come back from sabbatical and hear stories about backyard missions, how people were, instead of uh, just focusing like on this building, we could have had days of focus on let's get some things done in this building. And instead, we are a church that wants to pour out blessings. So we went out in the community and helped other people get their households in order, serving them in the name of Jesus. We also have uh, three people who right now, we'll see what happens with travel schedules, right now are scheduled uh, in the beginning of October to go to Kenya to see what's happening in disciple-making movements in Kenya, see what we can learn from them and also what we can do to invest in what's happening there. So, overflow campaign, emphasizing prayer, putting our stake in the ground, pouring out blessings. We're almost a year into it. If you haven't, it's time to jump on board. And if you've slipped off, it's time to get back, all right? The message this morning is about burdens. If you feel like I just put a big burden on you, you're going to love the message this morning because it's about carrying heavy burdens. It's about resting from the burden of religion, which might seem a little bit weird since here you are in church. Let me read from Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 25. Where it says, at that time, Jesus prayed this prayer. O oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. This goes with last week's message, right, about humility. We want to be a church that's characterized by being humble. And Jesus says it isn't the, the people who think that they're wise and clever who are going to receive and understand a message from him. It's those who approach him with faith like a child. He says, yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. There's some, again, it almost feels like math. Uh, like So the Father knows Jesus, and Jesus knows the Father. So there's a very relational thing going on here. And Jesus says, and no one knows the Father except those to whom the, the Son chooses to reveal Him. 
So there's this relationship between Father and Son in, within the Trinity. And then Jesus says, and I invite other people into that relationship. And what we're going to continue to see is that what Jesus invites us into is not just rules or religion, it's relationship. So if you want to know God, if that's what you're striving for, then you've got to know the Son, and He has to reveal the Father to you. Then Jesus said, and I want, this is where I really need you to tune in. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart. Then you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. We're going to dig into this a little bit. I, I'm coming off of sabbatical, time off. The word sabbatical just means rest. So I'm coming off of this time of rest. And one of the questions that I really wrestled with over the last couple of months is what does this mean when Jesus says, come to me, everyone who's weary and carries heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. What does that look like? Come to me, all who are middle class with some post-secondary education between the ages of 26 and 45. No, like, that's not what he says. Like We talked about this last week about the, the target audience, the demographics, sometimes in church we get uh, caught up in who is our target audience. Who is the target audience for Jesus here? He identifies them. Come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens. How many of us have felt weary and carried heavy burdens lately? This is a time where you can participate if you're in here. I see somebody nodding their head. How many of you have felt weary and like you're carrying heavy burdens at some point recently. Oh, there's like four or five people in here who have. I have. I'll put two hands up for me. This message is for you. The key idea is that being a humble disciple of Jesus is a relationship that gives us rest from religion. Being a disciple of Jesus is a relationship that gives us rest from religion. Now, he gives us rest from a lot of other things. I'm going to zoom in on this religion point because if we look at the context that he's speaking into, I think that's how he would have been understood by the people he was speaking to at that time. I think that's the closest we can get is that he's specifically talking about, uh, about religion here. And, and then we can take that principle and broaden it out. Has anybody ever had a conversation with somebody who said, I really, I consider myself a spiritual person, but I'm not into organized religion. This is another time where you can participate. Anyone? I'm, I consider myself a spiritual person, but I'm not into organized religion. That's a, a pretty common position to take lately. As uh, During my sabbatical, one of the really great takeaways from it was time spent with family. And I drove to Upper Michigan with my mom at one point and reconnected with cousins. Some of them had gotten married and had kids and I'd never met their spouse or their kids. Um, I have 17 first cousins on my mom's side. So um, there are a lot of them out there. I had a chance to meet some of them and I was talking to uh, my cousin's husband who I was meeting for the first time. And even like my cousin-in-law, I don't know if that's the right term, but uh, even he knew, oh, you're the one who's a pastor. I, that, I have that, that reputation. Even before he's ever met me, you know, you're the one who's a pastor. So we were immediately able to talk about some spiritual things because of that. And when I asked him, well, what's your background with church? And he said, well... Um, my wife and I, so my cousin and him, are uh, agnostic. Agnostic just means uh, we don't know, we don't feel like God can be known. 
Gnostic means wisdom. A means without. We just, we just, we feel like we don't know. We're agnostic. We consider ourselves spiritual people, but we're not connected to organized religion. That is something we're hearing more and more often as evidenced by the fact that uh, in Harvard, they've got 40 chaplains at, at Harvard University, and those 40 chaplains just recently elected their chief, their head chaplain, uh, and he is an atheist, which seems odd. He's a secular humanist, meaning that he's helping people find meaning and purpose and make a better world while also holding to the position, the belief that a supreme being is nothing more than a human invention. We just finished the Believe series where I addressed the existence of God way back in January, so I'm not going to get all uh, dig back uh, into that, but some books that were helpful to me when I would have doubts over the course of my life, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, uh, Letters from a Skeptic by Greg Boyd, all of these books kind of address the existence of God. So if that's something you want to dig into a little deeper, I encourage you to do that. The Language of God by Francis Collins, who I've been seeing on TV a lot lately. He's one of the preeminent scientists in the world today, and he wrote about the existence of God. Uh, this is a, a growing number of people in America are taking this position. What it demonstrates to us is that people are tired of organized religion, and that is nothing new. Jesus was speaking to people who were tired of religion 2,000 years ago when he said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. I want you to key in on that word yoke for a moment. Let me teach you, he says, because I'm humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear. The burden I give you is light. We usually don't talk about a yoke anymore because most of us aren't uh, plowing fields. We don't own oxen, um, and we probably don't have friends who do. A yoke, though, is that wooden piece that's carved for an ox so that it can attach to some farm implements in order to uh, move with purpose, in order to be directed and do some productive things. That's what the yoke is. And this term was used by Jesus and his contemporaries to describe a system, a system of rules or a system of belief, a religion that was there to help guide you in how to interact with spiritual realities and live a meaningful and good life. That's what religion is, essentially. It helps us relate to spiritual realities and helps us live a good, meaningful life. So when he talks about a yoke, he's basically talking about religion. Take on my religion. Rabbis at this time in history would have an outline of how they would interpret the laws of the Old Testament. And they would teach that outline and they would say to people, if you would like to be my disciple, this outline is my yoke. Take on my yoke. Now, some people might be hearing this and saying, well, I, I, I am against organized religion, so I don't, I don't have a yoke so to speak. And I would tell you that even a, a secular humanist has a system of beliefs that helps them relate to spiritual realities and live a good life. Even somebody who says there is no spiritual reality, it's only what can be observed physically, is still interacting with that spiritual reality by saying it is, there is none. They're still making a decision about it and they're still creating a system. Even a secular humanist, even an atheist, it, yes, it takes faith to believe that there is a God. It also takes faith to believe that there is no God because we can't know for sure. So if you think you don't have a religion, you know, maybe you just live life 
according to what feels good to you in the moment. I'm just, I'm just doing what feels good. Okay, that's called hedonism. That is a decision about how you're going to live. Every one of us has a yoke. Every one of us has some kind of religion. Even if we haven't defined it for ourselves, somebody has defined it for us and they say, oh, you're, this is the philosophy you live by, even if you haven't thought about it so much. Jesus and other first century religious leaders called these systems yokes. Pastor Mark shared the context with us a couple of weeks ago when he talked about the Pharisees criticizing Jesus' disciples for plucking bits of grain as they walked on a path and then eating that grain. And it happened to be the Sabbath day. And they were severely criticized because these Pharisees and teachers of religious law said, you're working on the Sabbath. That's work. You're breaking the rules. You're going against God by doing that. That's the kind of religion people react against to, uh, against today, isn't it? Where they feel like somebody's looking over their shoulder. Somebody's seeing you do something that you feel fine about. And they say, hey, you can't do that. That isn't pleasing to God. Stop that. Nobody wants that kind of religion around them. Not only do they not want someone looking over their shoulder, they never want to become the person who looks over other people's shoulders. No wonder people are reacting to religion. People at that day, in, in that day said, if that's what it means to be a Pharisee, then leave me out of it. People today are looking at disciples of Jesus, people who claim Christianity and saying, if that's what it means to be a Christian, leave me out of it. I don't want that kind of burden. I don't want that kind of judgmentalism. Now, Jesus saves his harshest words for those Pharisees. And I just I want to make a, a, a quick note here. I used to read the Bible, and we always kind of put ourselves into one of the characters' posi positions, right? I used to read the Bible and just assume I'm like one of the disciples. I'm a disciple of Jesus. He called me, and I follow, and I have faith in him. And for years, that's how I read it. And then there was a point, uh, it was when I was in college, a point that I realized, wait a minute, I think I'm a Pharisee. I think I've got this thing turned upside down, and I need to start reading the words of Jesus as if I'm one of the Pharisees, because I've grown up in the church. I've grown up in religion. I know the right answers. I know the things to say. I know the people who need to be judged, and I will, to their face or in secret, because I know what's right. Folks, if you are feeling like that, if you're in that position right now, you need to know the harshest words Jesus has are for the Pharisees, and those are words you may need to hear right now. For example, Matthew 23, verse 15. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees? This is Jesus. Hypocrites! For you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell you yourselves are. <gasps> Can Jesus talk like that? He does. He saves his harshest words for these Pharisees. He's talking about international missions right here. I'm not saying our international missions. I'm saying the Pharisees' international missions. Missions. I just want us to be aware that Jesus isn't always so kind and lovey and gentle. He does have times where he needs to call people out. And he calls out religious people. After giving all kinds of warnings to the Pharisees in Luke's gospel, we see the experts in religious law chime in 
And it, it makes me smile, makes me laugh a little bit, because he has these harsh words for the Pharisees. And then the experts in religious law go, um, did you realize that's offensive to us? <laughs> and Jesus answers in Luke chapter 11, verse 46, yes. <laughs> so he starts, did you, do, do you know you're offending us right now? Yes, said Jesus. What sorrow also awaits you experts in religious law? For you crush people with impossible religious demands and you never lift a finger to ease the burden. So is Jesus talking about religion when he talks about heavy burdens? It's really possible. It seems like a tie-in to how he talks to religious leaders. The Pharisees and experts in religious law, they had a yoke that was weighing people down and actually holding them back from knowing God and living in a way that pleases him. This helps us understand better what Jesus was saying in Matthew 11 where he knows people are weary and carrying heavy burdens. And he's inviting them, come to me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Now, if you know about Jesus, if you've read the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then when I ask, does Jesus ever make impossible religious demands? If you know his words, you'll say, um, yeah, he does. All the time, actually. He says things like, you've heard it said that it's unlawful to murder. That might be part of someone's yoke. They say, murder, murder equals bad. You have heard that said. I tell you, if you hate someone in your heart, you're guilty of murder. You've heard it said that adultery is a punishable crime. Jesus says, I tell you that if you have lusted after someone in your heart, you're guilty. Well, who can stand up to those? How is that a lighter yoke? Jesus doesn't remove the moral laws. He actually elevates them. It says, you want to live a life that's pleasing to God? Don't think about murder and adultery. Think about how you're murdering and adultering even in your own heart and mind. Now, there were hundreds of ceremonial laws. When we read through the Old Testament, there are instructions about how to relate to a holy, almighty God. And part of the problem is, none of us is holy. Part of the problem is, the, the wages of sin, the penalty for committing a crime against God is death. So there are these ceremonial laws about how do you, how do you clean yourself how does a sinful person become holy again so that they can be in relationship with God? And there's this whole system of sacrifices and, and, and systems of restoring your cleanliness. And a lot of the laws that the Pharisees and experts in religious law were burdening people with had to do with these ceremonial laws. What we see Jesus explain and his closest followers, they explain all of those things were pointing to our need for a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. We don't need all of those laws and rules anymore because Jesus fulfills all of that. So there are these kind of ceremonial laws that Jesus fulfills, and then there are all these moral laws that Jesus elevates and says, you've got to live a holy life. So while Jesus raises the bar on what's expected of us, what we see is that he becomes the way. 
Not only that, he sends the Holy Spirit to be the power of God within us to guide us and to advocate for us. Here's kind of how I picture it, okay? I know uh, some of us like word pictures. Some of us need to uh, see this in a different way. I picture, uh, have you ever been to the Grand Canyon? I picture the Grand Canyon. If you're a quarter mile back, you don't know uh, that it goes way down. You can't really see the rim from a quarter mile back, but you can see the horizon. If you imagine seeing the horizon and seeing the sun setting on the horizon, and if you imagine that sun being the, the Father, being God, being what we're moving towards, we're moving towards a, a right relationship with God, and yet the Grand Canyon is just a quarter mile in front of us. And where we stand, there are all kinds of vehicles that we can pick from in order to get to God. This is just how I picture it in my mind. It's kind of like a, uh, like a Mad Max kind of scenario that I'm, that I'm laying out here. Except the vehicles, and there are coaches there who are telling you or cheering you on, you have to push them. And there are people saying, okay, push harder. You're never going to get over the canyon unless you push harder. You've got to try more. And so there's pushing, there's pushing. And then at some point, the voice of Jesus comes to those who are weary, <laughs> to those who have tried so hard, to those who realize, I am never going to get over this canyon. And they have stood up and they have looked around and Jesus has said, Hey, look, okay, over here. I have a vehicle for you that has an engine. Not only that, I've made a bridge. So the Father is the direction that we're going. Jesus has made a bridge. And the Holy Spirit is the engine that powers us forward. He doesn't leave us alone. Yes, He elevates. He says, if you're going to be in fellowship with God, you need to be moving towards holiness. Guess, this is the thing though, you don't have to wait until you're holy because I have taken the penalty for your sin. I have justified you before this holy God. I am the mediator. Remember what he said earlier? Where the Father knows the Son, the Son knows the Father. And the ones who know the Father are only the ones who the Son brings. He becomes the path. He becomes the way. So when we think about religion, we often think about a set of rules that we have to follow in order to interact with spiritual things in a positive way and be better people in the world. We think of it as like rules and we decide which set of rules do I want? Which set of rules fits into my life? And Jesus steps in and blows that up and says, these rules, you're never going to be able to follow them. What you need is a relationship with me. Rest in me. I will give you the Holy Spirit who will be the power in you to move you towards God. I have made the bridge for you so that you don't have to worry about the canyon. Repent from your sins. Turn away from the way you've been trying to do things on your own power, with your own wisdom, with your own cleverness. Turn away from that and come to me like a child who says, I just need you. I know I can't do this on my own. And he says, that's right where I want you. Here's the plan. All these different rules, they boil down into love God and love other people, and I'm going to help you do that now and forever. This is the yoke that is easy, the burden that is light. Let's take some time this morning to stop working so hard to please God and please people by our own energy and our own intelligence and our own charm and wisdom and all the great things we all have going for us let's admit by god's standard we're scoundrels by god's standard we need his amazing grace how sweet the sound because it saves wretches like us 
We're bound to fail. Let's release that burden together. And even as Jesus instituted communion, which we often think of like a very religious thing, it was not to give us a religious hoop to jump through. Like, okay, if you do this, then God will love you more. That's not what it's about. It's to remind us of what he did to make our relationship right with God. Because being a disciple of Jesus is less about religion, less about rules, more about relationship. So let's take a moment and at home, uh, if you've got a piece of bread, that's great. If you have something that is approximately like that, do whatever is going to work for you. And let's give thanks. We thank you, God, for giving us Jesus. We thank you for the promise that he will give us rest as we admit that we are weary, that we are heavily burdened, and as we trust that he's done everything necessary to relieve those burdens. We put our faith, our belief, our trust in him. And we thank you for these reminders of what it took to bring us in a right relationship with you. Jesus, when he was with his disciples, took bread, he broke it in pieces, and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. This is Jesus making the relationship right by his blood shed on the cross. He says, do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Let's pray again. God, as you have made a right relationship with anyone who puts their belief, their trust in Jesus, we pray that we would continue to be conformed to his image, that we would become more and more like him, that we would see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives more and more, that we would love you and love our neighbor in ways that we couldn't have imagined before because it's what you're doing within us. We pray this would be honoring to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for tuning in. Next week, we continue in the same passage and we see that Jesus gives us rest from discontent. So I'm looking forward to seeing you next week as we continue to find rest. Go in peace.